Hello and welcome to Media 7, I'm Russell Brown. Not everything we do in the media makes everyone happy, and when people aren't happy, they may well complain. It's what happens next that we focus on this week. We'll cover North and South's magazine's handling of a furious reaction to a cover story on maternity care, and the BSA's decision to fine a complainant everyone agrees was 100% right. But first, the source. Sam Mulgrew looks now at the saving of one emperor penguin and the media madness it created. <laughs> Take a lost and lonely soul who picked out on sand sticks and stones, name him after a tap dancing cartoon character, and you can take a 10 week holiday from news. A sigh of relief for the world's new favorite penguin. Liters of ink, hours of radio, and trillions of pixels later, and finally Mr. Feet has been sent home. Even kids in crisis have had to move over for the wild animal. Chinese made fluffy toys are hot stuff. Bluebird flavoured chip makers couldn't have asked for more and the Hollywood producers of Happy Feet 2, due out in November, will be doing backflips. It's been over 40 years since the last Emperor Penguin came to our shores and in 1972 in Antarctica, a foreign virus carried by perhaps just one returning penguin killed 65% of chicks in a single colony. The balance is all wrong. You'll not often see any of New Zealand's 13 penguin species, four of which are endemic on our screens. And after making Mr. Feet a Kiwi icon, the media covered his every heartbeat. It even sparked this, uh, internet sensation. Happy feet, you such a sight. For all to see in black and but don't think it's over. For another four months, his tracking device will keep us all in the loop. That is, of course, unless he's eaten by his natural predators, killer whale, shark or seal, or makes another wrong turn, or loses his home to climate change, or is hit by a tourist vessel, or any of the other issues facing the icy natives of Antarctica. In the mornings, his ice will be changed, and in the afternoons, he'll be fed. All missed by the media over the past ten weeks. And we still don't know how much it cost us as taxpayers for Happy Feet to bring a smile to our faces, but at least we'll never have to hear that song again. Now, by the time Donna Chisholm filed her North and South cover story on the state of maternity care and the midwife system, she and her editor Virginia Larson knew it would be controversial. But they may not have been prepared for the firestorm that followed, up to and including a press council complaint from the new Children's Commissioner. He described the magazine's cover as degrading and exploitative. The magazine hasn't shrunk from the debate, and I'm joined now by Donna Chisholm and Virginia Larson. Welcome to you both. Donna, what for you was the core of this story? What's the key point? I think the key point is that 21 years ago we had quite a profound change to our maternity workforce, and despite this massive um, upheaval, really, in, in the the way that we deliver babies and the changes, um, nothing has been done to monitor the outcomes of that change. And that is despite repeated recommendations in recent years for a perinatal database and for significant changes to midwifery education. So nothing's been done and we don't know what the outcome of that change has been. Did you know that was the issue before you started or did it become apparent that that was the key point? I thought that that was the key point going into it, that why I was doing it was really to draw attention to the fact that, okay, here's a 20, 21 years since, and we still don't know. And I, you know, basically from talking to dozens of people for the story, um, Everybody expressed the same desire for that to happen, but it hasn't happened. Uh, another thing that, that came through in the story, and uh, clearly from you talking to people, was the number of people who had birth stories, and often quite unhappy ones. Did you anticipate that? I think we knew anecdotally that birth is a very emotional issue, and even if you have a great outcome and a healthy baby, it can still be a traumatic experience. We all know that. <laughs> but. Um, I suppose what became apparent was how many people had problems with midwives that weren't otherwise picked up, whether it was um, midw midwives not turning up, whether it was a delay in diagnosing a problem which led to a subsequent problem which, which you know, still had a healthy outcome but might not have. <laughs> now Virginia, I, th I think um, a good deal of the objection has been to the focus on midwives uh, rather than the maternity care system itself. And, and this cover here 
midwives in hot pink. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. And yet the story really is not strictly about midwives, is it? No, it is about the maternity care system. However, midwives are the lead maternity carers. So we did make that the focus of the cover. Obviously in a cover you have a limited amount of space, you have to keep things fairly concise. So we did make that, as we would if we were doing a story on lawyers, uh, we might pick a group of lawyers who were, you know, maybe they are, maybe there was a, a group using legal aid in some nefarious fashion. I mean, you, not every lawyer in the country would consider that they were being targeted. So we, we were looking at the maternity system in, a, in, a, in the whole, but obviously as midwives do dominate in the system, that became the focus of the cover. You seem to acknowledge in the follow-up editorial, which is very thorough, that perhaps the cover itself and the image of the baby may not have been your best call. Well, there are two things. We could have, I could have made the, the actual cover lines could have been made, it's more evident that it was a broader look, that we were looking at the maternity system as a whole. I'm, I'm still a little bemused at the focus on the image. That we, there was nobody, I mean, a cover design is not made unilaterally, you know, it is seen by a number of people, and a number of those people were parents, mothers, and we were not, you know, nobody expressed a real concern that that was going to And yet, now, yet now you have a press council complaint from the Children's Commissioner saying exploitative and degrading. What, how are you going to respond to that? Well, we're in the process of the response at the moment. I mean, we're going to stand by our, our belief that the cover, I mean, he talked about grotesque and potentially harmful. I mean, I thought it was telling that we had a letter from a, a neonatal paediatric professor saying, you know, pointing out to both us and to the commissioner that um, this was a method, this was commonly used, children, babies were often held up to clear the airways. Yes, it's not a practice that's used now, but we were actually looking at 20 years of maternity care, and was it harmful? That's the question. I mean, his focus is very much on the image. It's a Getty image from a reputable it's, it's, photo it's agency. It's just a stock photo, isn't it? It's yeah. a stock photo. In fact, I checked with Getty, and in terms of studio photos, all the conditions and consents were made on that photo. So parents, caregivers, you know, was the child harmed? I find that unlikely. Is it a photo that, is it an offensive photo? Um, I'm still mystified as to why so many, I mean I've got to concede that people found it so, but it seems surprising that a picture of a, of a practice used, I mean in fact you could say that... It's considered in the, inappropriate now, I'm not sure whether it's abusive. Well that's, that is the difference, it's, it's not used commonly, I mean you could say if you want to talk naturally, mm. a mother, a very natural birth would be a mother in a squatting position with the baby coming up out, upside down. I mean, I think um, what baffled us, what baffled us was that nobody took um, exception to the pictures of a, a brain damaged baby through um, bad birth care. What, what has also been put to me, Donna, is that uh, you set out to frame the CEO of the Midwives um, Group, uh, Karen Gulliland, as an angry woman. Do, were you looking to set her up? Heavens no. She, I mean, she was very angry when she spoke to me. Um, I've got the tape. Um, she later apologised after her interview with me, saying that she'd had a very bad day, um, and she had probably responded inappropriately to some of my questions. But I can't then go back and do another two and a half to three hour interview, which it, which it was with her. She she gave every impression of being sick of the story, sick of the doctor's versus midwife story. She um, was throwing do, her do, hands do in the air. Do you think you managed to get beyond that in this story? Well, I had, to, I had to reflect what her responses were to the issues that I was raising, and they were her responses, that she was entirely sick of this, that these issues had been raised and raised and raised ad nauseum, and she, for one, was over it. And, Virginia, you not only got angry feedback from the Midwives Association, you got, as you pointed out in that editorial, a, a firestorm on, yes. on Facebook in particular. What did you make of that? Well, there was a clear distinction between the feedback and mainstream media, which was measured and fairly sensible and uh, commentators, a number of commentators agreed that they were surprised by the Children's Commissioner's complaint. However, on Facebook it was, yes, it was an outpouring. I was, I was disappointed that so many of those posting remarks on Facebook hadn't actually read the story. Now, what was interesting... They haven't bought your iPad, at, that's the problem, isn't clearly it? Clearly <laughs> that's it, Russell. What I, what, what I found interesting is once they once we began to receive letters to the editor where people do have to give a name and an address 
and actually put a measured argument forward, then we were getting really interesting letters. And I have been, I'm continuing to print them. I have not, I've probably not been able to publish even half of them. But I am publishing those, that, and, and I'm doing it in a totally representative manner so that I'm putting the letters out there that are both supportive and critical. I, th I think it would be fair to say, if you say you have embraced the debate and you've embraced the issue, yes. double length editorial. Um, where, where does it go from here? Well, I think we will, we will move on, but I don't think this is, I mean, there was a sort of a, there's a little whiff of censorship with this coming from, I'm, I'm concerned more by publicly funded institutions, you know, taking complaints to the press council. You would think they would have the resources to, you know, make their point quite clear. I just sort of feel that we are seeing a little bit more of that that sort of exercise, and it's, it is, it, it puts you, you know, there's paperwork involved. But I think we, I, I'm not going to change how we approach stories. I believe they're important issues and we're always going to run into, into debate like this. Debate is good. I mean, yes, there might be things we would have done a little differently in terms of my part of this for the cover, but I'm not going to sort of suddenly decide we're not going to touch this topic because we know it's going to be controversial. Well, um, the, the Perinatal and, and Maternal Mortality Committee um, appears to be moving towards some of the things that, that you suggested should happen in the story, so perhaps there's, things are looking up. Well, 21 years later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Donna Chisholm and Virginia Larson, thank you. After the break, the serial complainer in the wrong, even though he was right.